Welcome to the public policy teach-in on the subject of pesticides in the news and all around us. I was trying to figure out how many years this teach-in has been going on and I think this is the 25th. You should know because it was your idea. <laughs> no, it was you. No. <laughs> well, we're not going to spend all our time arguing about that. I'm Nancy Ross, and I want to introduce our panelists in the order that they will speak, and then they will each speak for 10 to 15 minutes. After that, it's your time to ask them questions, and since this goes for an hour and a half, we'll have plenty of time for your questions. Our first panelist is Jay Feldman. He is co-founder of Beyond Pesticides, and he served as its executive director since 1981. He has been a regular and very much appreciated presenter at this fair. He has been instrumental in providing pertinent science-based information and support to community advocates, including here in Maine, promoting local pesticide control ordinances. His commitment to local efforts underscores the essential role which national environmental organizations play in our local efforts. Jay has a master's degree in urban and regional planning with a focus on health policy and a bachelor's in political science. He has tracked specific chemical effort effects, regulatory action, and pesticides law, particularly at the federal level. Given his professional work at the local and national level, he is skilled at working with the media to explain communicated pesticide issues to the general public, which we will have the advantage of today. Our second speaker is Carol Hubbard, MD. She has served as director of the Division of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics at Maine Medical Partners at the Maine Medical Center since its inception in the year 2000 and is board certified in developmental and behavioral pediatrics. She has long been concerned about the impact of environmental toxins on health and has given presentations at Maine Med on the their possible role in contributing to ADHD and autism spectrum disorders. She has worked with the Sierra Club's Cool Communities Project in the early 2000s to organize local workshops on sustainable and safe food, energy and housing, and also volunteered with the South Portland Clear Skies Project to oppose piping of tar sands and burn off of their chemical solvents in South Portland Harbor. She is one of the founders of the Sustainability Committee at Maine Medical Center. Sharon Tischer, to my right, a Juris Doctor, teaches environmental law and policy at the University of Maine. She is a past president of MOFCA and author of the Pesticide Quiz for the Maine Organic Farmer and Gardener newspaper. She served a term as president of MOFCA and chair of the Public Policy Committee, where she still serves to this day. She was appointed a member of the Board of Pesticide Control Advisory Committee for Indoor Pesticide Applications and served on the Maine Environmental Priorities Coalition. During her tenure as chair, the Public Policy Committee promoted legislative action on issues of genetic contamination, pesticide use on school grounds, pesticide registry and notification, need for pesticide sales data, regulation of integrated pest management practices, prohibition of GE corn in Maine, need for Maine, I'm going to run out of breath with all the things that Sharon worked on, need for Maine farmer market support, farmer right to farm, and the need to relax rules on home cheese production. 
she worked to establish working partnerships with several main environmental organizations. Let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists. And begin with Jay Feldman. Thank you. Thank you for that inter introduction. I appreciate it. Well, welcome everybody. Um, on a beautiful day, we're talking about pesticides, but we're really here because Mavka really has become an institution, obviously in the state, but in the nation, in advancing alternatives to chemicals like the one that we're focused on as sort of a case study today, Clopyrifos, which is an insecticide widely used in agriculture um, that was actually banned uh, or taken off the market back in 2000 for residential uses, uh, uses around our home and garden, termite uses, but left on the market in agriculture uh, golf course management and certain other uses. So the question is, why does a neurotoxic chemical that is known to cause brain effects in children remain on the market? This got some national press. Do you remember when Scott Pruitt was EPA administrator, one of the first acts he initiated was to reverse a, the previous administration's proposal to remove clopyrifos from the market. What I thought I'd do today is sort of walk you through how something like that happens under federal law, which you know you would think would, would be established by Congress to protect health and the environment and not be subjected to the whims of political appointees in various administrations. But actually, regulating pesticides and toxics is, is a political act. And it functions that way and has functioned that way uh, since the beginning of the legislation, which is called the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. We call it FIFRA. So how does a carcinogen or a neurotoxic chemical end up on the market? It goes through this process of review. Uh, all the data uh, that a, me a chemical manufacturer, uh, like Dow Chemical, now Corteva, has to uh, conduct is prescribed by EPA under its regulations. Mandated by Congress, prescribed by EPA, and EPA comes up with a list of studies and protocols, and those tests are conducted by the manufacturer, right? So EPA hands the manufacturer these tests, protocol, and then they are uh, subject to review. And historically, over the, over the years, we've found, um, or in investigators have found that there's been a lot of fraud, as you can imagine, there's sort of a conflict of interest there where the, the chemical company is doing its own testing. But be that as it may, the, the standards of the law itself are not subject to the kinds of review that we would like to see. First of all, it's not an open process, right? So as a manufacturer, Dow Chemical, I come to EPA with the data, I ask for registration, and none of that information is made public until the chemical is on the market. So environmental groups, parents who experience uh, poisoning in their children, have to then begin a process of cancellation. Now, th the basic underlying premise of this federal law is that we need pesticides to grow food. And this is the connection to what Mavka does, and I think what, what is important to organic. We need pesticides to grow food. The presumption is they have value, they have benefit in the marketplace, and as a result, we, we need to do everything we can to keep these things on the market and come up with uh, exposure levels. How much do we ingest? How much do we inhale? How much can get on our skin? Exposure levels that EPA deems are represent an acceptable risk. Well, what's an acceptable rate of cancer? What's an acceptable rate of asthma in children or learning disabilities? I mean, these are the kinds of questions that are being debated within a federal agency. When you start with the premise that we need these chemicals to grow food and to manage our homes, our quality of life, um, even to spray our communities for mosquitoes, when you start with that premise, then uh, you, you assume the chemicals have value and you work as hard as you can to keep those chemicals on the market. Chlorpyrifos got, got uh, public attention after Congress sort of reformed the pesticide law back in 1996, and it reformed principally the part of the law that focused on what we eat, what we ingest. And it said to EPA, look, we want you to come up with a reasonable 
certainty of no harm, that when we eat food, we're not going to be poisoned by these pesticides. And that whole process really broke down and has broken down around a process EPA which they, which you, which, where they use something called risk assessment. So think about it. You know, I, let's say I have cancer, or let's, I, let's say I have symptoms that could lead to cancer, and I'm then ingesting a carcinogen at low levels in food, and EPA is evaluating the effect of that carcinogen on people of average body weight, of average health, that don't have pre-existing conditions, that are not vulnerable in any way. That's our pesticide law. So even though we have a, a clause in the law that sounds pretty reasonable, right? Reasonable certainty of no harm, that sounds pretty good. When it's interpreted by the regulations, um, that reasonable certainty of no harm interprets to an allowable level of risk, allowable level of harm. And that's what we experience, right? We see the illness in our communities, we see the illness in children, in vulnerable population, in vulnerable population groups. So when EPA failed to act on this standard, they were sued by a number of environmental groups and farm worker groups. The concern about farm worker groups and the interesting part of this law is that the, the Congress said, look, we can't just look at that exposure on your apple or on your tomato. We need to look at that level of exposure um, in all aspects of your life. So does, is that chemical used on, on your home lawn? Is it used in your child's school? Is it used in your park? Let's aggregate that risk with the risk we get from eating the food. So that was a good thing. We thought that was a good thing. But they said to EPA, do not include occupational exposure. So essentially, if I'm a farm worker or a farmer, and I'm exposed to this chemical in production, I don't, I, EPA doesn't look at that, that exposure in combination. So the bottom line is it was crafted, the law was crafted in a way that tended to minimize the actual harm to people that are exposed, with the exception of farm worker children. Farm worker children do not farm as an occupation, and therefore their exposures are not considered occupational, and EPA was not evaluating the brain effects um, of the exposure. Uh, studies came out of Columbia University's Center for Children's Environmental Health that show these exposures. The problem was that EPA doesn't really look at the independent scientific literature and studies like Columbia came up with. So it took years for Columbia and environmental groups and public health groups and farmer advocacy groups to convince EPA that you need to look at these impacts on a very special group of children. This is what we call disproportionate risk. You could have a disproportionate risk in your family, given where you live. Uh, you could be living next to a chemical intensive farm. You could be drinking water that's contaminated. Uh, somebody could be eating chemical intensively grown food. And, and these are things that are not considered by the EPA. So finally, after a decade of consultation and some concerned people in the Obama administration, they proposed to ban the chemical based on this exposure to farm worker children and food use exposure. Um, that unfortunately happened as the administration was walking out the door, so the next administration had the opportunity to use its discretion to reverse that proposal, and that's exactly what they did. They claimed the science that was used for that decision was inadequate. They used their discretionary authority as the fifth for law gives them to discount the science, say that more research was necessary, and point to uh, uncertainties in the law. Now, uncertainties is an interesting issue. In Europe, when there's an uncertainty in the European Union on a potential outcome, on an exposure group, uh, they will consider that a, a bad mark against that chemical. If we don't know everything we should know about this chemical, why are we allowing this exposure? Um, there are a number of states, as a result of this EPA reversal, that have taken this, taken this issue up. Uh, the state of Hawaii, uh, New York, and California have, have used their state authority to ban uh, chlorpyrifos. Now, they're doing it uh, in a phased out manner. Hawaii won't be banned until 2022, New York 2021, and the California, those were both passed by statute, by state legislatures. 
uh, the California bill is a regulatory action by the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and they expect it will take two years to initiate and complete their uh, registration. Chlorpyrifos is one chemical. You know, Rachel Carson wrote, wrote about DDT. You may have heard about Alar. You're reading about glyphosate in the news, that weed killer that, again, is not being regulated by EPA and local governments all across the country are taking it out of use in their parks and schools and recreation areas. Um, these are uh, hot-button chemicals where people are clearly being harmed. I mean, the school uh, employee landscaper, Lee Johnson, who used Roundup for many years and got non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma, took his case to court. And in court, a jury of his peers looked at what EPA did and didn't do, and basically said that uh, we think you're, you should have some compensation, $179 million of compensation. So when people look at this stuff, they say EPA is not doing its job. When the courts look at this data, they say EPA is the expert. EPA evaluates the science. We as a court can look at procedure, the law, did, 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 did EPA follow proper procedure, but we can't second guess EPA on the actual scientific findings. It's very rare that a court will do that. So I've spent about 30 years playing whack-a-mole with a number of these chemicals I just mentioned. We can add synthetic pyrethroids to the list. We can add 2,4-D, Agent Orange, 2,4-5-T. We get these chemicals banned over decades, but the real solution is not to presume chemicals are acceptable and needed, but to move toward a systems change in which we don't allow these chemicals to be used. And that's exactly what we're doing under the Organic Foods Production Act, where we look at, we have a standard that says no adverse health, no adverse health effects are allowed. We look at essentiality, are these materials needed to grow our food? And we essentially look at compatibility with organic systems. How does this chemical impact uh, biodiversity? It's very important, I think, as we start these campaigns to ban individual chemicals, as we're working with our local elected officials and our state officials, and these chemicals do need to be banned, that we give them the bigger picture. What are the deficiencies in the way we regulate chemicals? And why do we need to advance uh, alternatives? Why should we support organic? Why do we need more support for organic farmers to transition to, and conventional guys to transition to organic, uh, organic systems? Um, one thing you should be aware of is that in addition to all these deficiencies in the pesticide law, we're actually not looking at a whole bunch of things that are critical to our health. You know, we, we have to be concerned about mixtures of chemicals because we're exposed to mixtures on a daily basis. Synergistic effects. Do two chemicals coming together cause a greater effect than each chemical individually? Endpoints, endocrine disruptors. You know, the, the endocrine system in our body is the message system in our body, and those effects are not evaluated by, by EPA, despite the fact that EPA mandated EPA was mandated by Congress to do this. So I guess my message in the end is, let's push as Maine has, we've, we've seen Maine over the years be a leader on, on different uh, topics like GE corn, genetically engineered corn, uh, and restrictions on certain pesticides. Let's push those specific bans, but let's see what we can do at our community level to eliminate all these uses. And Maine, Maine is in a special place. Unlike six other states, Maine has upheld, despite efforts by the state legislature to reverse this, Maine has upheld the right of local municipalities in the state to restrict pesticides within its jurisdictions. And everything I've mentioned today, and believe me, there's a lot more, and I've left our newsletter journal up, up front here, you can read about it. Everything we've talked about today really is, serves as the basis for why your local community should be transitioning to all organic practices. So we have organic agriculture, we need to take those same principles and apply them to the management of our playing fields and schools, our parks, our lawns, 
are public spaces and open spaces. So thanks for all your work and what you're doing and for being a part of this tremendous fair, which is just incredible. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? So I'm Carol Hubbard. I'm, I direct the Developmental Behavioral Pediatric Program at Maine Medical Center, which means that I spend my days working with children with autism and intellectual disability, learning disabilities, ADHD, and other neurodevelopmental disabilities. Um, and in addition to my own personal environmental um, perspectives, I became interested in the question of why are many of these conditions increasing so much in prevalence, especially autism? You've probably heard a lot about that in the news. And the question is, is there something in the environment, some environmental risk factor that's contributing to that increase? So I became interested in that question a few years ago and did a lot of investigation of the literature um, and was happy to be able to update my knowledge for this presentation especially focusing on organophosphates and chlorpyrifos. Um, so today in my 15 minutes, I will um, be talking about the modes of exposure to this pesticide, the mechanism of action, how it's toxic, um, especially focusing on the impact on children, which as Jay commented is one of the big concerns, and then finish up talking about ways that children can be protected from pesticides in general. So one of the things that I've learned is that chlorpyrifos is really, um, I believe, one of the most widely used conventional insecticides. It's used on over a dozen crops, um, so it's really quite um, prevalent in the environment and it's been found in traces and ecosystems from Arctic fog all the way through aquatic microorganisms to conifers in various parts of the United States. Um, for people, the most common occupational mode of exposure is inhalation, so farm workers breathing in <clears throat> the chemical. It's also absorbed through the skin, ingested in drinking water, and the most common non-occupational exposure is um, in residues on produce. Higher levels have been shown in the air around agricultural establishments like orchards. And it's been detected in a lot of human body fluids, breast milk, blood, sperm, and meconium, which is the feces of newborn infants. Um, and interestingly, when it was banned, as Jay mentioned, in <clears throat> around 2001 from indoor use, the levels in humans did drop. And there have also been studies that have shown that when children are switched from non-organic to organic diets, the levels of chlorpyrifos and organophosphates in their bodies also drop. So that's encouraging. This is a chemical that acts on um, acetylcholinesterase. Um, and one of the tricky things about pesticides is because they're acting on insects, which are eukaryotic organisms, meaning they're, they have higher cells just like we do, as opposed to bacteria, which are a different sort of cell. A lot of the toxicities on their target insects are also potentially toxicities for humans. So insects have acetylcholinesterase, so do we. This is a chemical that um, this pesticide binds to and re irreversibly inhibits it, which leads to an accumulation of a neurotransmitter or a chemical messenger called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine in the body has a lot of different roles. It's involved with um, nerve cells signaling skeletal muscle cells, so it plays a role in movement. And it also has different roles in the central nervous system um, in learning and cognition and attention and memory. So if you have acetylcholine, if you have chlorpyrifos um, poisoning, you only return to normal functioning when your body can synthesize more of that enzyme, more of the acetylcholinesterase, and that can take a while. There's also a big question about whether there's other impacts of chlorpyrifos even beyond the effect on acetylcholinesterase. So non-acetylcholinesterase impacts have become a big focus of research, and those happen at lower levels. So if you're acutely exposed to this um, toxin, you develop symptoms like um, muscle weakness, you have um, increased tear production, 
you have um, weakness and tremors and diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and impaired vision. And then you can also develop a slightly more chronic muscle weakness. It was really interesting to me when I was doing research, I learned that the symptoms of um, a black widow spider bite are quite similar actually, because that also impacts the system by releasing acetylcholine, this neurotransmitter. I think what's harder to tease out are the longer term effects. Um, and part of the reason this is hard is that to look at subtle effects that don't result in immediate toxicity, you um, really best study this by looking at people that are exposed and going forward over time and comparing them to non-exposed people, but that's hard to do. Um, so therefore studies on laboratory animals become important, so that's one source of data. Another problem with people is that they're often exposed to more than one chemical. So it's hard to figure out what's the effect of one versus another. Um, we can also look at other creatures in different ecosystems, so look at the impact on aquatic animals, for instance, and there's a big body of research um, in that area. It's also hard if you um, ask people about exposure to toxins, their recall may not be that great. So if you ask someone five years ago, what did you, what happened during your pregnancy, that may be hard to remember. One of the things that I learned that I find very disturbing is that our current administration is very suspicious of the use of epidemiologic studies, which is looking at human populations and how um, different substances impact those populations. And that really, epidemiology is a mainstay of science, and there's all sorts of, of well-respected methodology for epidemiologic studies looking at populations. Um, and in the case of chlorpyrifos, there's several what are called prospective studies where they start with a population of folks and track them forward over time. So Jay referred to this. There's been three big studies of mothers who are exposed to pesticides during their pregnancies and then looking at their children going forward. And those studies have shown concerning impacts on children. Um, there have also, which I'll get to, there's also been a, several, a number of studies on adults who are occupationally exposed um, to chlorpyrifos and the general consensus is that for even for adults there can be long-term neurologic um, impairment in things like executive function which is planning and organizing um, sort of related to ADHD symptoms, visual spatial ability and various forms of memory. Um, there's also been links shown to Alzheimer's disease but not to Parkinson's or um, ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease. There's been some concern for cancer, but I think the neurodevelopmental and the neurologic impacts of chlorpyrifos are a bigger concern. And then there's also the concern that Jay mentioned about it being an endocrine disruptor, which means that it can interfere with um, testosterone, estrogen, and thyroid function. So in children, um, why are pesticides such a concern for children? So children tend to be more exposed. They're crawling around on the floor, they're putting things in their mouth, they're not washing their hands. Um, they also have a greater surface area for their body size, so this can make them more exposed to different toxins. They also have an immature blood-brain barrier. That means that chemicals that get into their body may be more likely to cross that protective barrier into their brains. And there have been studies that have shown much higher levels of um, chlorpyrifos per kilogram of body weight in um, young children. So um, in 2011, in the general U.S. population, the level uh, was 0 0.009 micrograms per kilogram. And in toddlers, it was, zero, it was 0 0.025, so that's much higher. Um, children also may have a decreased ability to detoxify chemicals um, because their livers are immature. One advantage is that they can synthesize replacement enzymes like acetylcholinesterase faster, however. So what do we know about children? So from these prospective cohort studies, which are very powerful epidemiologic studies, um, it has been found that exposure in the second and third trimester of pregnancy and even into early childhood, so not just in utero, but even into early childhood, can lead to decreased IQ Studies have shown a difference of 1.4 to 7 IQ point decrement with exposure to chlorpyrifos. Memory problems, slower motor development, and an increased risk of ADHD and autism. And these effects can persist into adolescence and adulthood. So they're long-term effects. Now, as a scientist and a physician, I tend to be a skeptic. 
of data in general. Um, and it's amazing what you can read different interpretations of the same data by different sources. I found one study that was definitively showed that there was no increased risk of autistic symptoms in rats exposed to chlorpyrifos, and it wasn't until I really looked at the fine point that I realized that it was really a chemical industry study. So we have to be really cautious, and I think the same is true even for really strong environmental advocates. You know, it's easy for us to look at the data and interpret it to support our perspective. But there are some very credible sources who um, have raised real concerns about chlorpyrifos and organophosphates. So the American Academy of Pediatrics is an agency that I greatly respect. It's my national professional um, organization. And they came out in 2012 with statement, a statement, prospective contemporary birth cohort studies in the United States link early life exposure to organophosphate insecticides with reductions in IQ and abnormal behaviors associated with ADHD and autism. So that's a pretty strong statement from a fairly conservative and very evidence-based group. There have also been national and international agencies that have um, raised concerns or supported bans of chlorpyrifos, mostly due to these concerns about neurodevelopmental impact. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, the World Health Organization, the EPA, as mentioned in 2016, and most recently, last month, the European Food Safety Authority um, published a statement that they did not think that there was any safe level of chlorpyrifos and that it should potentially be phased out of use, which I think may happen in the future. Um, so and that's what is known about its impact. Um, there's clearly reason to, for much concern. And then the question is, how do we protect children from this compound and others? And again, I look to the American Academy of Pediatrics, which has some really um, sensible and good guidelines, and I think this is also a great topic for discussion in our discussion time. Um, but some of their tips are, I think, especially reducing exposure to pesticides in food. So organic produce has really been found to have less pesticides and a um, potentially lower risk of exposure to pesticide-resistant bacteria as well. Um, so eating organic is really important. They do make the point that eating produce at all is more important than eating none, even if you don't have the option for organic. Wash and scrub fruits and vegetables with water, which reduces pesticide residues. There's also, a, as I'm sure you know, lists of the, the dirty dozen, the, 12, the most contaminated foods, the least contaminated foods. These have been issued by Consumer Reports, among other agencies, and they've been revised somewhat recently, so our family gleefully started eating blueberries from a lot of conventional blueberries from different countries, which we weren't doing before, trusting in those recommendations. Um, storing chemicals safety in the, safely in the home, and then if pesticides are used, um, obviously being really careful reading the labels, not using bug bombs or broad pesticides, but using integrated pesticide management, keeping children away from fertilizer. Um, interestingly, for there's some pretty strong chemicals that are used for lice, so there's recommendations about avoiding lindane and some of those chemicals. Um, and then for people who have occupational exposure, making sure that they take off their clothing and they take precautions not to bring it home to their children. And then there's obviously a huge role for advocacy. I know in my family, um, my husband is really adamant, like if any of those little white flags appear on lawns around our neighborhood, if they're not for a dog fence, he would never let our children go on those lawns, wouldn't let them go anywhere near them and, um, you know, try to educate neighbors about the dangers, so. That's what I know. Could we wait till the end? Just say. <laughs> Thank you. So my assignment is to talk to you about what the state of Maine is doing to protect you from these toxic chemicals. But I'm going to get there a little roundabout way. Uh, first, I'm going to give you all a quiz. And this is one of the questions for my quiz and primer on the Mofco website. And knowing this audience, I'm sure you'll all get 100%. But there's only one question, so you only have one chance to do it right. 
Okay, ready? All right. True or false? Pesticides that have been approved by the EPA for use by farmers are safe when used as directed. False. True? False. Yay, I knew you could do it. All right. It's not only false, it is so false that even the EPA says that if you make, if you're a manufacturer of pesticides and you make that claim, you have violated federal law. And that's, I checked last night just to be sure that that regulation hadn't been repealed by Scott Pruitt or Andrew Wheeler, and it's still on the books. So let's keep our fingers crossed for that one. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a little story because I actually, chlor, I use chlorpyrifos as kind of a case study in my environmental law class when we get to pesticides. And I dug up this kind of fascinating story about um, one of my, one of my heroes before he fell off the deep end with pride prostitutes, and that's the Attorney General of the state of New York. You may have heard of him. Um, Elliot Spitzer, right? So, in 94, uh, and this is all about chlorpyrifos, our poster child for this um, for this teaching. Uh, uh, the name of uh, the name that Dow marketed it under was Durspan, this particular product. So, in 94, uh, the state attorney general of New York kind of looked into how um, how. Dow was marketing this product. And this kind of relates to a big question you probably all are sitting here with. Even if the government completely fails us for various political reasons in terms of regulation, why would farmers use this stuff? Why would they expose themselves, their children, uh, their, ch their workers and their workers' children, their waters and their land to, to highly toxic chemicals that are long-lasting and uh, when there are, are safer ways to do it? So this is the answer to it. And the answer is something that Rachel Carson wrote in 1962. 57 years ago, they fall prey to the blandishments of the hucksters. Old-fashioned words, we admit, but I think most of you realize what that means, the blandishments of the husk hucksters. So here's a perfect example of it. Um, uh, uh, Spitzer found that um, they were repeatedly in their marketing materials, and in particular, he was looking at the marketing materials from Dow to the Agways, the Blue Seals, the Farmers Cooperatives, the various agencies who acted as middlemen and retailers of these products, continually claiming that Durspan was safe when used as directed, or just safe generally. So they, they brought in action, and Dow sort of caved and said, you're right, we violated the law, please don't fine us this time, we promise, and they promised in writing, we will never do this again. Then, when was this? In 2003, they took another look at it. They took a 10-year look after this. They were doing the same damn stuff all over again. And I got a hold of their evidence sheet um, for uh, the kinds of things that they were claiming about Durspan. Now, this is... This is three years after the momentous event in 2000 when the Clinton-Gore EPA uh, took the step of basically banning half of the uses of chlorpyrifos in the country. All of those, it was the leading household pesticide at the time. And they said it's definitely not safe for families and children, so no more household uses, except for termites for a little bit longer. And then that, that was it. Uh, so they took this major, major act after a thorough scientific access, uh, assessment. And um, <clears throat> here's what Dow wrote to its, all of its distributors after this after this momentous event at the EPA. The rules have changed, but the safety of Durspan hasn't. <laughs> the safety of Durspan hasn't changed. And these are in, in like letters, and some of them are in training videos. Um, <clears throat> We steadfastly believe in the safety of chlorpyrifos. If you have pests you want to get rid of, I see no reason why you should not use a product that has been so effectively and safely used. The average American wants a safe product, 
and that gets the job done. Durstband products do that. On and on and on. Pages and pages of lies sent to the people who market these products to the farmers. And um, so what do we have to compete against that? Part of what I'm going to be talking about is the Board of Pesticide Control in Maine, which is a regulatory authority. But the other, the other thing that we have in Maine, which is great and which I personally have used on several occasions when I had a, a pest issue, uh, right across the river from me in Orono, um, the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. And just yesterday in the Bangor Daily News, headline, Pesticide Maine Potato Farmers Use is Being Banned Around the World. This is a different pesticide. It's a fungicide, chlorothalonil, used on, on potatoes in Maine for fungus. This, unlike chlorpyrifos, has been determined to be a probable human carcinogen um, in by the EPA, by the US EPA, definitely there, but still today it's used uh, in conventional potatoes uh, and uh, we have someone back there who could probably tell us a lot more about that, an organic potato farmer, um, but it's used 12 to 15 applications per season and before that, a year or so earlier, I mean a maybe a decade earlier, 15 to 20 applications. And so the Cooperative Extension, the fellow that this profile, Stephen Johnson, I don't know him personally, but he has been working for 10 years to, um, to persuade farmers that there are newer products that are safer than this. Don't, don't use it. And now where a number of, where now they may not be able to ship to Europe at all because it's now banned in Europe. He's maybe beginning to make some headway on, 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 on that issue. Not that I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm basically however telling you that your safest route with potatoes and all of your vegetable purposes, et cetera, is through buying organic. Um, but, okay, so the BPC, I covered the Board of Pesticide Control for, um, for about 10 years writing in the Mafka newspaper about it, and I was a kind of journalist advocate. When an issue came up that Mafka cared about, I would also wear my Mafka hat and take a position on the issue, so uh, it was kind of a juggling act. But the BPC was, uh, the, I'm going to say BPC, Board of Pesticide Control, state agency under the Department of Agriculture. Um, it was created in 1971, and in addition to the regulation of pesticides role, it is charged with safeguarding the public health, safety, and welfare, and protecting the natural resources of the state. My experiences were sometimes inspiring, sometimes frustrating, covering uh, the work of the BBC. But I'm going to I'm going to highlight some of the positive experiences. First, um, the state of Maine, through a somewhat contentious hero hearing that Mafka actively participated in, as did I, on behalf of Mafka. Um, uh, BBC was the first state in the nation to, to ban or to refuse to register genetically engineered corn that incorporated a biologic pesticide, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. First state to ban it and last state to cave in and finally approve it in 2007. And I think it was about a period of 10 years where we were like the only state where uh, people were not using uh, BT uh, corn. We, we, MAFCA helped to develop a, a regulation about pesticide use in school that mandates that families be told ahead of time about what pesticide applications would be and that mandates that these only have to be applied when it's a last resort, applying IPM measures, um, pretty good regulation and it's still in effect. Um, uh, in 1999, the, the board approved a what's called a critical pesticide control area, a special ruling to protect one family and just one 11-year-old child who developed radical multiple chemical sensitivity after being oversprayed with the organ organochlorine glutathione, and that held that no one could spray within half a mile of her residence glutathione. The, that regulation is still on the books and available. I'm not aware of the, the, the potential for getting that kind of protection if you have a demonstrated medical need. I'm not, um, I'm not sure. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I'm not sure if it's ever been applied again, but it did. Uh, I think they, they ruled the right way then. Lastly, um, one of the roles of the B, 
USPC is they have inspections of farms, random inspections. They don't cover every conventional farm. They also in inspect organic farms, but they show up and they want to see your pesticide registry. You have to have a, I mean, you have to have a log that where you write down all of the pesticide applications you've made, in what quantity, how often, and they want to see it and they want to check out what pesticides are in your back shed to be sure that they're properly registered it, by the feds and the um, and the and the uh, and the state. So I'm going to tell you a little story, and it will make you think think forward. To to uh, Thanksgiving maybe and how the BPC was out there protecting all of our Thanksgiving dinners. Um, on September 11th, BPC Inspector Ray Connors, who incidentally is now the Director of Compliance of the BPC and I think that's a well-deserved, based on this evidence alone that I have, it's a well-deserved promotion. Uh, but at the time there were six inspectors who would go all over the state and Try to, try to cover as many farms as they could. So he was doing a routine inspection on, the, on David Pop at Pop Farm in Dresden. And he looked at the application records. And this is about chlorpyrifos again. He, he noted that according to the, the farmer's records, it, he was applying chlorpyrifos at four pints per acre Whereas the label instructions, and it's a federal um, violation to not follow the label instructions, federal instructions on the label said three pints per acre. He was applying it a third again more than he should have been. And um, he was only supposed to be applying it two times in the course of the summer, but he applied it three times, an extra dose. If something is good in small quantities, you double it, right? This was, this was his philosophy. So they proceeded to take some samples of these cranberries. Remember, this is September, getting ready for the Thanksgiving cranberry relish season. And they found that the, uh, the residues of chlorpyrifos, no big surprise, were four times the legal limit. So the crop was destroyed. And he was fined uh, $250. They estimate the value of the crop between three and $5,000 that was destroyed. So this is a success story. And, um, and this is why if you have an issue or concern about pesticides, maybe about your neighbor's use of pesticide, there are provisions in, in, in the pesticide quiz, that there are details about uh, provisions provided to you by the main board of pesticide control to deal with those situations. You can always make a complaint, you can get on some pesticide registries. And I just wanted to close by saying that we have kind of a new, If you, I hope you've all noticed that things are a little different since January in the state of Maine, right? And we have, um, we have a new commissioner of agriculture, a former longtime board member of MAFCA, Amanda Beal, and we have a new director of the BPC, um, Megan Patterson, who got uh, both master's and bachelor's degrees in ecology and environmental sciences, where I teach at the University of Maine. And, um, and also worked to convert a portion of a 2,000 acre conventional farm to organic production. So I had two conversations with her, trying to, inviting her to come here. She, she really wanted to, she would have come, but this was her scheduled family vacation and she just couldn't swing it. So she's not here today, maybe another, another year. But when I first talked to her, she was really angry. Not at me, but at the fact that she had set aside some money in the budget to, for the first time since early 90s, make a compilation of exactly how many pesticides were sold in May. We got a bill passed in the 90s to require this to happen. And for three years following that, the head of the BPC came up and said, it's impossible, we can't do it, please take this off the statutes, because we're failing. And it went off the statutes. But without any nudge from the legislature, she wants to do this, and, um, but she thought she had lost the money, and then the next time I heard from her a few weeks later, she was very sorry to say she couldn't be here, but she has the money to tell us this year how many pesticides we're using in Maine and in what sectors, et cetera. So that's, that's, that's good news. Heather, do you have a microphone to take I, around to questioners? I do, and I'm just getting 
just kind of reorganizing here. So <clears throat> this this lady was first. <laughs> Um, I just have uh, two questions. One is, some of the um, product names that these chemicals are in would really help mm. to know, like what the brand names are. That's one question. The other is, what is your opinion about um, spraying uh, to eradicate uh, the brown tail moth? Who wants to take that? Jay, do you want to take the formulation? Yeah. <coughs> you know, you can. You can get on the EPA website and, and identify this. EPA, if you pick up a product label, you'll see it has a listed ingredients, active ingredients, other ingredients. This is another part of the story, obviously. But um, and, and the agency is regulating those active ingredients. They're not regulating full formulations. But you can track down the, the names um, on the EPA website or go to beyondpesticides.org. And, and look up the active ingredient. That's what you need to start with. And then you can identify the product name. So the second part of her question was brown tail moth and what the panelists think of spraying. Who wants? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to pass on that. I mean, generally our experience has been that the spray programs are may have a short-term efficacy, but long-term not. And so, you know, there are questions of, you know, how we're managing land areas, and typically the chemical use um, exacerbates the problem, you know. So the, the key to all of these problems, whether it's, you know, whether it's gypsy moth or whatever the, whatever the problem is, is to find biological controls. You know, that's, that's been the most, the best, solution and you know our our sort of basis of moving forward is that we've got to be more concerned about biodiversity because pests are emerging whether they're exotic or invasive plants or insects they're emerging because we're out of whack in terms of our biological diversity so you know it's there are some often short-term advantages to a spray program but they're, they quickly evaporate because you know the, the resistance develops in the target insect and there aren't any natural predators because we're spraying the chemicals that are killing broad spectrum, uh, having broad spectrum effects. So that's not a very specific answer. Heather Spaulding is MOFCA's deputy director and an expert on pesticide policy and I know you've spoken to the press on this issue, Heather. What did you say? I actually was going to introduce Paul Schlein, who is here, and he's also a member of our public policy committee, and he has worked deeply on this issue of brown tail moth and other <laughs> invasive. I think the, the quick answer on the question about pesticides and brown tail moths is that first of all, closer. First of all, the effectiveness is in question as far as the use of any of the insecticides. They cost thousands of dollars to apply. You can go it tree by tree, you can have somebody spray. Um, but if you're willing to spend that much money, if you have that kind of money, you're better off finding a good arborist who can climb trees or has a bucket lifter, whatever they call a bucket truck, and they can go up to 65 to 70 feet actually. And that's, and if they can do that, that's 100%. I, I don't yeah. spray, but maybe some Uh, the, the question, uh, the, the point you're making is that you don't apply pesticides, but your neighbors do. Um, that's a question of public education. Hopefully you're in a town where, uh, as I am, with, with an excellent conservation commission that provides education on a regular basis. Um, they're they're um, trying to think of other, but have you spoke to, spoke to them personally? And they're still resistant to that. Um, there is enough information out there that you probably could find from, from good sources to give them because I can understand where just the conversation may not be as effective as some factual things coming from 
established sources. Um, I, I could probably get you some information, actually, and give you my email address afterward. Um, in any case, I, there was probably one other point I was going to make, but I, I think personal protection really has been established as the most effective way. There are many things you can do. They're not that complicated. You know, clothing, showers, um, and that's all documented as well. And it's very effective. That's what I do. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of a little bit annoying sometimes, you know, cutting grass, uh, carrying firewood, all kinds of things like that. You can wear coveralls and then you don't take those into the house. You wash them. But I'm just saying in terms of talking to your neighbor. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So this woman over here I think was next. Unless oh, yeah. you have something to I, add. I did. I had uh, something to add and it's to build on what Sharon was saying earlier about the successes of the Board of Pesticide Control and the potentials there. Um, so I was at the Board of Pesticide Control meeting on Friday, um, not this day, not yesterday, but last week, and of course. <laughs> and um, it was so great because there was a, a request for a variance in Maine law to allow to be allowed to spray um, two chemicals um, on a shoreland area. Um, to push back against um, invasives, uh, bittersweet in particular, and honeysuckle. And the Board of Pesticides Control is, you know, generally pretty lenient with variance proposals. You know, generally they give the green light for these, you know, re special requests, special treatment. And the people who generally vote, you know, no problem, just go ahead, go ahead. Across the board, they're like, nope, nope, we're seeing that these chemicals are not working on invasives, and we're not going to allow it. And I was, I was like, this is so great, we're actually making some progress. And this was, you know, this was a, a local land trust that was hoping for this variance, and so, you know, you wonder, like, who are they picking out to re reject the variance proposals? But still, it was very encouraging that, that uh, that was a, a rejection. So, over here. Yes. Uh, addressing this to speaker number one and three, um, in trying to establish a local pesticide ordinance in a township, is there anything that says legally in the state of Maine that we can inhibit or prohibit a farmer to be endeared to the pesticide ban that is proposed? In other words, we want to do organics. Uh, when I read the pesticide Maine state laws, it says all sorts of things about economic outcome that, you know, they can do things if their crop is failing or blah, blah, blah. So but that's where our pushback is going to be because we yeah, have yeah. a lot of farmers. Yeah, so you want to, you're, you're on the cutting edge even beyond Portland and South Portland and Concord. You want to regulate farmers. And uh, you're, you, you, you got a lawsuit on your hands, I'm afraid. <laughs> Not that I don't think you're right, but there's, um, the other towns have exempted farms because they have been threatened by the Department of Agriculture um, under a statute that's called the Right to Farm Act that says um, uh, that uh, farmers can't be sued for nuisance um, if, if they follow best management practices and they say that includes all of these pesticides. Um, but my, my opinion is that that law doesn't uh, does is wrongly and way overly interpreted by the previous Department of Agriculture's anyway, who um, who wanted to use it to prevent local regulation of of farms. <clears throat> I do think it's it would be um, it would be a big battle, and it, it it could spill over into a legislative fight to try to take away the local right to regulate pesticides at all. Um, so I'm not. I'm not. I think you need to think long and hard about if you want to. You want to um, take that. Take that approach because you know there have been like three different efforts in each of the last legislative sessions um, to take away Maine's right. And Maine. Maine is. I last I heard Jay. Maine is one of seven states that have the right for municipalities to regulate. But were your comments telling me that the other six states caved in and took that away? No, no. Utah's just caved in. So okay, okay, uh, all right. Okay, so we, we have to fight pretty much every year to keep that right. And, it, and, and uh, 
um, trying to prevent conventional farmers from using their pesticides through municipal regulation. 